Okay, welcome back to our second part of, of, um, of our anesthesia lecture on cardiac and pulmonary physiology. And we're gonna now delve into the pulmonary aspects of care from an anesthesiology standpoint. So we'll touch on pulmonary circulation briefly. And I think most of you should remember exactly how this works. I've kind of written a little um, pathway there of how RV, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, pulmonary capillary beds, uh, pulmonary veins, and then back to left atrium is the route that the pulmonary circulation takes in the body. And uh, this should be review. Uh, there's a, a small fraction of that blood that goes, it's called bronchial circulation. It actually uh, feeds the lung tissue, but this is sort of what we're talking about, we're talking about pulmonary circulation. And the primary thing that we have to think about with pulmonary circulation in anesthesia is, um, is uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension, it can be caused by a variety of things, sleep apnea, uh, cirrhosis, it can also be idiopathic, but it certainly is related to increases in morbidity and mortality in and around surgery. So uh, it is something that comes up and it's often diagnosed via echocardiogram. So you can see the increased pulmonary artery pressures on echocardiogram. You can also see it um, with uh, a central uh, uh, with central pressure measurements, like with a swan Gans catheter. Uh, so if you're in the heart room, you might see them using those and you could ask how they're measuring uh, pulmonary artery pressure. I put a little picture here on my next slide. Uh, here it is. Uh, showing the pulmonary circulation. Um, again, review for you guys. I don't want to like belabor some of the uh, physiology that you're so familiar with. Here's a brief picture of the pulmonary circulation. Should be um, self-explanatory. Um, and uh, good to note that pulmonary artery pressure is much lower than systemic pressure. So it's a low pressure system. And uh, another way that this it, it accepts the same amount of cardiac output, though, as the systemic system. And the way it uh, can and adjust to that amount of flow is by changing the resistance. And so there's a lot of really interesting things in anesthesia about pulmonary vascular resistance and how uh, anesthetic techniques like double lumen breathing tubes and position of the patient can affect that, as well as spontaneous ventilation versus being... Uh, intubated with positive pressure ventilation affects the blood flow to all the areas of the lungs and the ventilation of those areas of the lungs. So um, pulmonary artery pressures are kind of an interesting pulmonary hypertension is the first interesting topic here that you can talk with about your preceptor. The second would probably be uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. So we're going to review that really quickly and go over some anesthetic scenarios that are really interesting to, to see this um, concept at work in real life, which is, I think, one of the best things about anesthesia. So uh, again, you want to say pulmonary vascular resistance is low compared to systemic vascular resistance. And basically, when the, when, the, when the pulmonary vascular resistance changes, it changes by recruiting new capillary beds. So they can either do more capillary beds to reduce the resistance or fewer capillary beds to increase the resistance. So that, that's how that works. And uh, increases in cardiac output or pulmonary artery pressure increase the recruitment of capillary beds and decrease the vascular resistance. So if the cardiac output really goes up, your, your, um, your pulmonary system will decrease the resistance to that flow by recruiting new capillary beds. Um, and there's also other situations, high and low lung volumes can change uh, per vascular, peripheral vascular resistance. And the classic example that you think about this in is one lung ventilation. So there's ways to have a breathing tube that only breathes for one part of the lung. So the other half of the lung will be deflated and thereby the surgeon can do surgery on it. And the other one will be ventilated. And it uh, pretty much demonstrates uh, this concept of increasing resistance in the, in the lung and how the blood flow adapts to that. So um, another note that pulmonary circulation is not affected that much by systemic sympathetic stimulation. It's all sort of regulated by, um, by endogenous uh, uh, secretion of different hormones and things. So 
there's not a lot of great treatments. Treatments. So like when we have a low blood pressure, we can think about using ephedrine and phenylephrine to increase the blood pressure in the systemic uh, circulation. It's not an option for pulmonary circulation. In fact, really the only treatment we have um, that's specific for decreasing increased pulmonary artery pressures is nitric oxide, not to be confused with nitrous oxide, nitric oxide. And that is an inhaled drug that does vasodilate the pulmonary capillary pulmonary circulation. Um, there's things that cause increases in, in pulmonary artery pressures, things like hypercapnia. Uh, and these are all things you can talk about with your preceptors to learn more about uh, treating that problem. Uh, then we're going to get into clinical settings. So there's three clinical settings you want to think about. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So when there's a low alveolar oxygen pressure, the pulmonary capillary beds vasoconstrict. So the reason, you know, sort of reasonably that makes sense. So it decreases the blood flow to poorly ventilated areas of the lungs. So you're kind of, your body is trying to match the ventilation to the perfusion. And, and when it's matched, the blood gets oxygenated in your, in your body. The blood is then pumped back to the heart and then distributed to the system, your whole body to oxygenate your body. Um, so when, when hypoxic vagus hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is working, it's really a useful thing for you. Um, it improves oxygenation during surgery that require one lung ventilation. So once we uh, are no longer ventilating a whole lung, uh, the body should naturally start sending more blood to the ventilated lung, which is helpful. So you can talk about that in those types of cases if you're doing a thoracic case with that. Inhaled anesthetics, however, can impair hypoxic vasoconstriction. Opioids and propofol do not. So when you're doing a one lung ventilation type case, you may adjust your anesthetic to optimize your hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And so it can really can be neat to see that, you know, minimizing the amount of inhaled anesthetic you use and maximizing these other drugs to treat your patient well. Pulmonary emboli. This is a classic situation where you actually are stopping the blood flow to part of the lung because there's an emboli, a clot in the pulmonary circulation. And it's a terrific case to talk through with your preceptor about how that affects the ventilation of the lung and how that affects the oxygenation of blood. So uh, arterial thickening, that's more uh, about, um, can be caused by by congen congenital reasons, cirrhosis, idiopathic, but it increases pulmonary pulmonary vascular resistance. And it's an interesting case as well to discuss with your preceptor and to think about while you're doing your rotation here. Um, pulmonary gas exchange. So, uh, you know, we're always measuring oxygenation. And there's two real ways we do that. The one you'll see all the time in the OR is obviously the pulse oximeter. And then the more direct route is to measure the uh, pressure, pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. So you can actually put an arterial line in. You'll probably see your, your see this in some of the cases you're in on, and then actually draw a sample from there and get the oxygen level in the blood. And that can be another way to measure uh, oxygenation. Okay, uh, you can look over oxygenation hemo, oxy, hemoglobin dissociation curves. It's a great question to ask. Uh, and think about when uh, you see your preceptor, um, you know, using a higher percent of oxygen than 21% to pre-oxygenate the patient or to ventilate the patient, uh, how the pulse oximetry measure reflects the arterial oxygen level and how increasing the FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen can change that curve and for the better for your patient. Um, Intrapulmonary shunt. This is another great time. If someone has atelectasis, which is a pretty common thing during surgery, how is the how does that create a shunt, and is that favorable or not? Great thing to talk to about your with your preceptor. You read about it in this chapter. I'm sure you've learned about it. And now, when you're in the OR, you can really see that in real life. So, atelectasis is a very common thing, particularly in laparoscopic cases where the abdomen is inflated. You can go through those and start asking how you treat atelectasis in, in an anesthetized patient. It's a pretty neat process. Carbon dioxide. Hypercapnia is uh, greater than 80 millimeters of mercury is considered uh, CO2 narcosis. So, can, you know, most of the time, uh, increasing CO2 causes increased rest ventilation and respiratory drive. There's some causes, though, of, of hypercapnia while under anesthesia. I listed some there. 
and it's a great thing to talk about, I think, at the time of extubation. When you're extubating the patient, uh, your anesthesiologist will be looking at the carbon dioxide level and assessing whether or not they're ready to ex take the breathing tube out. And um, it's a terrific time to talk about hypercapnia and uh, what they're looking for in terms of extubation criteria and causes of hypercapnia. You know, hypoventilation is kind of an obvious one, but there's others in anesthesia that come along that can be terrific to talk about in real time. So problems with the machine, uh, problems with metabolic demand, all of these things come up during a typical anesthetic. Um, Looking at pulmonary mechanics, so uh, there's static properties of the lungs where the lung tissue tends to, is very elastic and wants to close in on itself, and the chest wall wants to press outward, and how those two forces balance each other to allow you to breathe and keep the alveoli open in addition to the presence of surfactant. So these are great things to talk, think about, uh, especially if you're seeing a patient get a chest tube and think about the pressure. Um, uh, generated there and, and why you put one of those in um, and the overall negative interpleural pressures that sort of counteract each other and kind of keep the lungs open and situations where maybe that changes is a nice thing to think about in the OR. Pulmonary dynamics. Pulmonary dynamics kind of the second thing is when you get statics, it's all about tidal volumes and airway pressures. So uh, resistance and, uh, and flow essentially. So uh, why do you set the tidal volumes? Uh, at a certain a certain level, you'll notice every case with a with a breathing tube, they'll be setting their rate and their tidal volumes. How do they pick that? How do they follow that? How do they know that's the right amount? It's a great question to ask. Uh, airway pressures. When you're seeing peak airway pressures, we measure airway pressures all the time under general anesthesia. What is considered high? What is considered low? And what are the causes? And if you ever hear the the peak airway pressure alarm go off, uh, you'll notice the anesthesiologist will be basically diagnosing the problem, looking at equipment, is the patient wheezing, what can I do to fix this problem? And, and usually after it's all cleared up, it's a great time to ask what they did and how they figured out what to do. Is the breathing tube kinked? Is the valve stuck on a, in the breathing machine? Um, is there a foreign body? Is there, um, is there other things that you can do to change the tone of the bronchioles themselves? Um, yeah, so looking for high peak airway pressures, you'll probably see that at some point, it's a great thing to talk about. Control of breathing. Breathing is controlled by both central and peripheral receptors, chemoreceptors. So the central ones are in the medulla and the peripheral ones are in the carotid body. And they tend to look at PaCO2 to increase, if you increase the PaCO2, the pulmonary artery, the um, partial pressure, pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, you increase ventilation, kind of makes sense. Uh, that's what those hypercapnic respiratory response, ventilatory response is. And there's also hypoxic ventilatory response. So if you um, start to see low, or you're low oxygenation, your body increases its ventilatory drive. Uh, and the great question here is how anesthetics affect those. And, you know, what you'll start to learn is that almost all anesthetics depress these types of reflexes and uh, uh, opioids, sedative hypnotics, volatile anesthetics, all affect these drives and uh, how do you adjust for those in your anesthetic. There's also certain patient factors that come into play. Neonates are particularly underdeveloped with these um, types of reflexes and how do you take care of those patients well. Uh, another terrific topic that you can kind of put your knowledge into a clinical setting really easily. Um, there's two suggestions in the book about kind of combining the cardiac and the pulmonary systems together. And anemia was the first question. So this is a list of questions and discussion points that you could have with your preceptor about anemia. Is it acute? Is it acute? Is it chronic? Is it, uh, what are the treatments? How does being anesthetized affect this equation? Uh, and um, uh, I think these are really fun things to talk through with your preceptor. The other they came up with was metabolic demand. You know, if you have a patient shivering in the PACU, they're using a ton of oxygen and creating a lot of carbon dioxide. And how does that affect uh, the heart and the, and the respiratory systems? Uh, what, what reflexes are kicked in? What changes are you going to see? And uh, how do you treat it? And these are real world things that you can see as an anesthesiologist and in your rotation. And um, I'm hoping that these will really help you start thinking about your learning in a different way. And um, thank you so much for your time.